is our fourth time meeting up. Um, our, I'm just going to briefly introduce the presenters because I think we have a couple people on here who haven't haven't been on some of the other ones. So we have Peter Broly with uh, Primary Sales Australia, and Cassie. I hope will be showing up a little bit later. Peter, maybe. Yeah, he's he a, should be. I know he's, okay. he's on the road between. Uh, so he's on the road. He, he'll he'll be here shortly. I hope. Okay, great. Well, he he's an ag diesel technician um, and a harvester specialist. Um, Brett Asper is also with us and he'll be presenting. He's um, a mechanic, right? A harvester mechanic, Brett, with 30 odd years experience. So um, we might, and we've got Michael Walsh on here too. Maybe Michael will give us a little, <laughs> another Australian who's in Kansas now helping, uh, helping Americans out with this kind of thing. And uh before we let the Aussies uh, present and educate us, I did want to give some of the American farmer collaborators a chance to just talk about what they've seen in the field this fall, because I think it's fresh in mind and, and we have pictures and thoughts and questions. So, um, Michael, Brad's not on, but did you want to, can you share pictures from his operation and talk at all about what he saw? Sure, yeah. So... <clears throat> Brad um, Ashby, who's one of the, the primary combine operator at Shockley Farms, they've had a Redicop unit on a John Deere S680 since um, harvest of 2020. So they've had, this will be the third soybean harvest uh, with it on, uh, happen right now. Um, when Initially, when, um, I'm trying to share my screen here. Initially, when we installed it, there was a couple just sort of small learning curve problems that I'll just try to share here. What well, I'm sharing the screen. Okay. So one of them was, um, you guys can see this, right? Yep, looks good. Okay. Green machine. Um, all right, so the Redicop kit comes with this, sorry, it's a little small, but it comes with this cover here, um, which I was told was basically keeping sand from coming off this tire, getting sucked into the cleaning windstream. And we were having a lot of troubles getting, a, you know, clean beans into the tank. We're getting a lot of pods and stuff like that. So they basically just took that off. And this is what they ended up, you know, just back to the sort of the, the OEM configuration of that's being vented. So the cleaning wind comes in there. It might draw in more, you know, sand particles and, and wear the mill down. But after that, it was pretty easy to get, get a clean sample there. So that was that was one of the issues. Um, we did have this happen a couple of times. Uh, so you can see the pile of residue that we had the hand pulled out of the back of the machine that some of you are familiar with at this point. Um, this happened when it was off. Um, and where we think the initial bridging and blocking was, was in the, um, the the leading edge of the baffle that's inside. So in the off position on the Redicop, it kind of folds up uh, and can just stay installed. But once we just took it all the way out, we haven't had this problem since. Uh, you can see this was supposed to be a field of soybeans and it's pretty much 100% common ragweed. Uh, so that was just sort of our early litmus test of like, well, if this is a field that it's going to work in, it's, yeah, we got some weed seeds to kill here. So, so that, that was a, I think pretty easy to overcome issue. Cause we just took that out. The other one was, um, again, while it's been off. So again, if you're familiar with the Redicop, this is basically you're in the back of the of the combine here's the mill down at the bottom of the picture and so you're facing the out the back of the combine backwards in this system there's two two sections of the baffle that move this is the lower section and it would like fold down to cover the uh, opening here and when it was off so much residue was falling underneath that it actually like pushed this up and broke this uh pin assembly here on both sides so you know, when it's running on, it, that hasn't been an issue, obviously, because the, the material goes through the mill. But that was one one hiccup we had. The door is pretty easy to replace. Um, no big deal there. The last one I'll share. So here's, you know, we're looking into the back of the combine uh, facing forward. And this, I think most of the mills have something like this that kind of extends this shelf 
uh, to try to keep the straw stream up high and not fall down into the, the chaff stream coming off the sieves there. And a couple of times we would have stuff kind of build up on this. It wasn't, it wasn't getting shot off that beater and, and into the straw chopper. Um, that's only been in, in real wet materials, but, and that's really hasn't been a consistent problem at all. It's only happened a couple of times. So yeah, other than that, um, it's, it's been running well for us, uh, there. So maybe we'll turn it over to the next, uh, farmer to share, Emily. Yeah. Kenton, did you want to talk a little bit about your experience there in central Virginia? I can, I can pull up and share some photos from your operation. Yeah, you might be better off uh, sharing the photos. Sure. But <laughs> I, I guess my uh, experience was similar to the Shockleys, uh, maybe a little more extreme. Uh, when I started off uh, in soybean harvest, uh, we had good beans, very dry, and I started off around the outside of the field, but I was basically losing so much horsepower and it, it going so slow that I, I just, I mean, we're talking like 0.8 miles an hour that I felt like I couldn't run it. So I took the belts off the IHSD, uh, didn't have it running anymore and just opened up the, the access panels in the back. Well, I couldn't make it two acres before I would clog up the back. It was just the residue. It couldn't, the hole that's there uh, just isn't large enough for things to come out. Now, the picture she's showing here was a little bit later on, and I was in beans that were, uh, you know, high yielding beans, but they had been sprayed with the fungicide, so the stalks were still green. Mm -hmm. And uh, I basically, this was about, I put the, put the mill back to, all together put the belt on, I made it about 300 feet and it stalled the engine out. I mean, I turned it off real quick, but, and it just absolutely clogged it up with wet uh, chaff. So I, I've had... That's, is that corn? Yeah, that was in corn. That was some earlier photos. I tried, I did try to run it uh, earlier in some corn and if I had any any weeds which usually were morning glories they were still green and it, it just immediately clogged up like that I mean that was that's like 50 feet into the field uh, and then I turned it back off. Tell and them about this this modification you made Kenton. I, I took a piece of sheet metal and, and basically I couldn't make it anywhere without it clogging up and if you'll I guess uh, I put that over top of the the auger, the horizontal auger, that it helped the material flow through, but mm -hmm. it still would would clog up on you. You know, those the pile of uh, chaff that you saw from the Shockley's farm that uh, Michael had earlier, I probably have forty of those across the fifty acre field. Uh, you know, we went out with a power rake on a skid steer and just tried to smooth them out. You know. Because in a no-till operation, a big pile of chaff is a problem. Yeah. Um, and you can see the, the beans that clogged the mill up there on that photo. There's Palmer, and I really wanted to run it in there. Uh, they were dry. They were 13%, but the stalk was just still had just enough green uh, to it that uh, right there. Hopefully you can see it, and there's a good example of Palmer. Uh, mm -hmm. in a field but anyway like I said it just it, it was 300 feet it clogged it up and I just had to turn it back off and put my shield back on and keep picking at that point how did it do with the did it clog the, for all the corn harvest or did you have some success there if there was any if it was dry clean corn with no weeds in it uh it it would run fine, you know, mm -hmm. no, no problems at all. It, it's just that if there were actually weeds <laughs> that I yeah. wanted to, because in, in corn harvest, you know, the, while the corn is brown, the, it's still early for us. You know, I started in, uh, in the last couple of days of August through September, we haven't had a frost and everything's still green and weed 
wise is still green and growing. What do you what uh, what is so, this weed climbing the climbing the corn here? Uh, that's some Palmer. I don't oh, I don't geez. know that I have pictures of the morning glory, but I any farmer that's familiar with morning glory, it's a it's a vine and it's just it'll encompass over it'll grow over top of the standing corn. I, I won't go into the details. It was a couple of fields that I was doing a split application of a pre-emergent and we didn't get on it in time. So it only got a half of application. It was a non-normal for me, but nonetheless, it was a, it, it occurred. Beyond that, just telling you I had a frustrating time with it running. I don't, I'm not sure what else to say. Okay. I'm happy to answer any questions. But. Yeah. Well, let's have, um, I don't think Brian's on. Sarah, do you mind chatting briefly about what you saw with when Brian ran the IHSD in the rice fields in Texas? You talked a little bit about it, but on the record now. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, no problem. So um, our rice was harvested in, one was in mid-September uh, mid and the other one was early October. Um, our two fields, were a little bit different in the weed population. The first one, well, it was cross-planted, so it had very high rice plant population to begin with. Um, but also besides that, um, it was full of barnyard grass. Um, this is an organic rice farmer, um, so they don't really have any other control options to begin with. Um, we had no issues with it. It ran beautifully the whole entire time. Um, I was so ready for it to be broken down. And as a grad student, um, you're just prepared for the worst thing possible. And thankfully that did not happen. And it was great. Um, he was really happy with the performance of the machine overall because barnyard grass is one of those weeds that it gets in there and you can't differentiate it with even an herbicide in a conventional field. Um, the chaff moisture, uh, I have to go back and look at the data, but it was not clogging the machine, um, nor was the straw. It was laying it out pretty nicely. Then that second field that we went <laughs> to, um, because it was planted a little bit later, uh, we had different weed species in it. Um, we had some barnyard grass, um, some jungle rice, which they're really close to each other. And then we had purple amia which um, I described the seeds as little fish balls that like explode when you would pinch them sort of. So it had a very high moisture content. It was still really green and you can sort of see it in these photos that Emily is sharing. Um, it's that pointy multi-branched, that's pretty much not a grass in this field. Um, and we were able to get about three, four passes in, and then you just heard the machine start powering down, um, like it was chugging along and it was having some issues. Um, and then we got to the end of the plot, and the next step was to remove the um, panels of the IHSD for our off position. And we just looked at it and we're like, yeah, this thing is not happy right now. <laughs> it's clogged. It is you know, all of the above sort of going on. So that was the inside um, when we took those panels off. And then if you look to the side, you can see a clogged image of it as well, which I think would just be that next one to the right. Okay. Yeah, um, one more, yeah, there you go. So it was, it was not happy. Um, and unfortunately, because the time constraints, I don't know what he did to clean it, but I think that would be a good question possibly for the people who know more about this how would you clean out this clog situation um or when it does happen or any of the other farmers that have had luck cleaning it out anyway um any other questions no that's great yeah ken how did you clean yours out when it clogged up and, and how long did it take uh, not going to like this answer. Uh, I took the IHD off, off the back of my machine and I set it in a barn and it's still packed full of stuff. <laughs> and before we use it here this next week, I'm going to have to figure out how to clean it out. <laughs> Maybe we should have Brian reach out and tell you what he did. 
you can ask them in the WhatsApp. It, it looks very complicated. It looks like it's going to take hours with a air compressor and a air hose and maybe a pressure washer. I don't, it's so full. It's it looks difficult. <laughs> Ronnie, I know, did, like when we were in, I know when we were like in the field, they were literally just putting their hand up in the IHSC and just pulling out chunks of it. Um, but I don't know if they had to clean it further from there to just keep it going. But yeah, I think that's a good question. <laughs> yeah. Rodney, you had some experience with this. Why don't you chat a little bit about your, you ran it in wheat, corn, and sunflowers, all three this year? Correct. We, we probably went through six, 700 acres of hard and soft wheat flawlessly. I was rather impressed. Uh, it went through uh, a couple thousand acres of corn. And the only hiccup we had on corn was when we had what we call seeds, a wet spot where sunflowers normally we can't farm. And so what happened is the sunflowers hung up as they came out of that kicker at the back of the machine. Those uh, sunflowers were so long and sappy, they hung at the top. Uh, and we just stopped the, the cylinder up on the combine. And we just had to get up in there by hand and go to dig it over our head. And it just uh, took us probably an hour and corn to dig it out. Uh, and sunflower, when we actually went to harvesting sunflowers, uh, it, it did the same thing in sunflowers. We didn't desiccate them. And it was a lot worse because it was lots of sunflowers. And uh, we dug for hours. Uh, it was just a simple getting up there over your head and being one. It packed it so tight in there before we realized what was going on. You said, you got one sunflower. And then keep going until you could start getting pumps out. Uh, so we could never, even though it turned, we never had any trouble with the actual seed structure itself. It's just starting to build up a little bit, but I told the group before we started, we did 12 acres with that thing off, I mean, on the sunflowers, and we have lots of volunteer and sunflowers, and they were zero. It was amazing what it, the seed structure actually did to sunflower seed if we could just have managed that stock. But to ever get it to work, we finally had to go up in the machine, turn the, the uh, seed destructor off, and then take that diverter that's up at the top. We, it kicks it out of the back of the, com the cylinder, that diverter plate, we had to take it off because no matter what we did, they would hang on that diverter. And you'd have to go to digging. Uh, of course, we learned to do it a lot quicker. We were more careful. So it wasn't as long the second time we did it to dig it out. Um, so in the end, once we took that diverter out, it worked. You know, the combine just worked like normal. But we were we were happy with it. Uh, the wheat, especially, it was, it was fabulous. That's kind of, I don't know if you have questions or if that's what you wanted to do. That's perfect. Yeah. D if anyone does have questions for Rodney or any of the farmers, Peter, you or your team wanted to ask anything before you guys get started, go ahead. I think we I think we're probably raising some really good stuff that's going to come up as mm -hmm. the guys go through the flow and start talking about thrashing and a little bit about the um, separation area um, uh, and undoubtedly the stuff you're talking about as Brett said earlier we're seeing that here it's it's um, it's pretty normal kind of stuff um, the challenge is going to be we talk about the negatives we often don't talk about the positives so it's good to hear everybody say like i can't actually destroy the weeds i am actually doing that um because it's very easy to cycle down into that gee it's blocked it's this rather than actually going you know what what happened if i look back at some of these paddocks we can see some changes so but just a reminder what we are trying to do is we are trying to improve the um productivity and performance of these machines so um yeah i think maybe maybe emily we should push on i know that time is tight all around uh, no i agree i agree i was going to ask you to do your little intro where you go through the difference in australian and american combine okay. terminology <laughs> and then take uh, it away okay sure all right so 
couple of things. Firstly, just from a etiquette perspective, um, and I guess we can't go to the bathrooms are here or et cetera, but from a, a pure etiquette perspective, we have different terminology. And while most of us uh, are speaking in the, uh, in the English, like I say, the King's English now, isn't it? In the King's English, um, the there are some words we use that are different. So we'll try and call them harvesters, not headers. We'll try and call them head of fronts, not whatever you want to call them. Um, but really also importantly, the there's things like we'll talk about a baffle versus a diverter versus so if, if there's words that are being used, please raise your hand and say, I'm not sure I understand. Um, because the idea here is for everyone to learn and the word is everyone. So remember, as Brett's been saying and Kat has said to you previously, we're here to learn too. Um, the other thing is that uh, because we all speak a different version of the King's English, if someone is talking and you're not really hearing them clearly, please raise your hand and, and pause us. We can slow down, talk more slowly as so I'll try to enunciate my words but please do it because otherwise we're just not getting the greatest value out of what's here so bear with us your job is to raise your hand if you're not understanding or you've got a question um, but the aim of the game here is for us all to learn and to improve how you increase your productivity and performance of these harvesters um, and, and hence we want to come back with some questions following some of these um, I think I've covered everything there, Emily. Is there anything else I've missed? Nope. I was just going to say, I'm going to keep an eye on the chat too. So if anyone's having trouble or has a question, just pop it in the chat and I'll, I'll let people know. Cool. Um, on that basis, we just a reminder, we, what we have, um, what we try to do here is go through the flow of the machine. So those of who remember, um, we started last time and we talked about, um, firstly, we all we did kind of a bit of an overview of what we wanted to understand. Last time we talked about the head of front uh, and what we're trying to do with the head of front. Um, today, we're going to be looking at the areas of um, looking at the thrashing system and separation. And we will discuss the, the back end of the machine a little bit too. Um, we've got some other um, great inputs available here. Uh, Emily's already mentioned, you've got Michael Walsh, who's run away from Australia to go and learn some stuff over in, in Kansas. Um, I think he clicked his red heels together and went over the, over the rainbow. Um, we look forward to hearing from him too. Mr. Newmes is here too, which is fabulous. Uh, the man has got a wealth of experience from um, the Wheat Smart guys to input and keep us aligned. But um, what I'm going to do is throw something up on screen uh, and hand over to, to Brett and Cassie. What, what we thought we'd do is get Brett and then Cassie together to talk through the flow in terms of how machines thrash. Um, and then how they separate. And when we go through thrashing, get you guys to ask questions. So look, what I'm putting up on screen, if I can share my screen, um, is a, let me do it, a diagram looking at, um, looking at the, how a machine works and operates. So what we're stealing here, this is a diagram of crop flow. Um, we've borrowed this from Nick Berry, which we've also used elsewhere in other training programs. Um, and you'll have seen this with Pete Newmes and with Ray Harrington. It basically shows how the, a basic harvester set up um, for a, a, and how that flow works. Um, what I might do is just flow through to the next one. We talked about last time how a draper front works. This is some of the stuff we talked about last time. Brett, do you wanna give any reminder comments to the guys around what some of the things we discussed around the front? Cause I might just give a bit of a quick two minute reminder. Uh, yep, just, just remember all of the things um, that we were talking about as far as front losses go. Um, you need, you need to measure it, quantify it, um, and then 
just fiddle and play, you'll find a happy spot for your crop variety. I mean, as as Pete was saying, and as we've all said, yes, we've got the same challenges that you guys have got, but some of our crops are slightly different. So um, <clears throat> that's going to make that's going to have a bearing effect on what happens. So and where your losses are from. So, yep, go Pete. So the, the important element, I guess, here is if we can't get both crop and weed into the into our fronts and into our machines, those things you've got on the back, whatever harvest weed seed control system it's going to be, uh, really we're defeating purpose. That's why we're starting at the front and talking about that setups. You might remember there's some numbers. We'll make this um, diagram available elsewhere so you can refer back to it. Obviously, it's also in the recording now, so you've got a reference to go back to, and uh, we'll be sending out a test later on. No, I'm kidding. We're not going to send out a test later on. Um, but the idea is we start to think about the basics of, of what it's about. The area we're going to be talking about today um, is really the next section, and I'm going to hand over back to Brett. So, Brett, do you want to take us through with yourself and Cassie talking about what we're going into next? We've got, we've got the crop on the front. What the heck happens now once we've done that? Right. So understanding where the material flows will help us heaps. So on all of our rotary machines, once the material leaves the feeder, it's going to enter the concave on the right-hand front corner. Understanding that will help us if we're trying to find um, the sources of not so much losses, because once it's in the machine, it's not a loss. Um, but we might have partly thrashed heads and or um, material that's in our sample that we can't find. How do I explain? Um, material that's in our sample that we can't eliminate that we don't want in there, right? And often we'll find that that's the first place that it comes out. Remember that material as it enters the concave is in its it's in its transition point. It's actually being squeezed in because our drum or our rotor and concave setup, we have a we have a pinch point or a close point. So our concave isn't the same shape as our rotor. It's actually a bit wider. So it's got an opening and, and, and like an entry and a departure angle and we'll have a close point. The standard machines that you guys are running, your case and your John Deere, that close point or pinch point is right at six o'clock. It's at the bottom of the concave. Okay, that's sort of critical for some of the crops that you're growing. And what we've learned here in Australia is it's not the best spot if we're gonna grow cereals and smaller material. So, but we're not gonna talk about that just at the minute, just understanding where that pinch point is. So as our transition on the right side, you can see my hands, that material is going to get squeezed in. At that point in time, all of that, crop flow is being tried to be squashed down through a little tiny narrow area okay at the point where it's all squeezing in the only thing that can happen is we can get part heads or or unthrashed portions coming through a concave right it'll then go through and get thrashed and then the opposite side the opposite thing happens on the right on the left side of our machine as that opening or that area um, opens up that's where we get our separation and typically 70, 75% of our separation happens on the left-hand side. Um, it's not real good for a flat sieve loading. So we need to think about that. Um, what we've learned here is that um, we need to do everything that we possibly can here to deal with this because of, of the things that you guys are seeing at the back, okay? We, we can't fix your baffle and your separation on the sieve. We've got to fix it up the front. So in those photos, you can see the volume of material that's actually going into that mill, okay? So all of that material is actually either falling out of the beta separation stream or it's actually ending up on, on the sieve. Are we, are, we having the, are we having the images track with the presentation? Because I'm seeing like the arrows of where he's pointing to not lining up and are, is this, the crop and MOG flow schematic is what you're still talking from? Yes. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. 
Um, there's only, in this presentation, there's only five slides. We could put 500 slides in there and give you death by PowerPoint. But what we'd rather do is, is have the one image and with, with the flow arrows on it. Does that make sense? So you're, you're following, so you need to follow the thinking around the flow arrows. Is that correct, Brett? Yes. Yeah. So, so at the moment, what we're dealing with is we're dealing with the grain arrow and I just diverted into the straw stream just for a moment as we're talking about fallout. Does that make sense? Right, so our grain stream, which is the orange arrow. Okay, so where does our grain then go? We've got our separation and we haven't looked at this left to right, but typically what we find is that the machines will be left hand loaded. Okay. Uh, okay, yep. So I don't have control of the mouse pointer. Peter does. I do, and I'll keep it out of the way. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I was trying to actually free yeah. up so he could point, but I can't work how to do it at the moment. So I'll just leave it out the way. No, 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 it's okay. Um, so, all right, we're talking about the grain stream. So our, our material that is now separated through both the thrashing and the separating area. Just remember the difference between thrashing and separating. And none of these machines have a huge separation area really. Um, so what we're trying to do is trying to use some of our thrashing area to separate as well. So the, the idea is thrash it as, as early as we possibly can and then separate it, okay? And only hit it as hard as you, you need to so that you get all your grain thrashed because the harder you hit it, the more material you end up with on your sieve. And so let's go back a second. I should have done this at the beginning. I'm going to make two big statements. Adding a mill to the back of a combine is going to teach you more about sieve loading and airflow in your machine than anything that you've ever done in your harvesting life. And don't worry, I've lived this for the last 20 years. We've been trying to do this sort of stuff for 20 years and we still haven't got it right. Well, I'm not gonna say we haven't got it right. We've still got these challenges and, and these challenges are because we're messing around with what's coming out the back of the machine and it was not designed to do this. So let's push that aside, go back to my crop flow. So now we've done our thrashing and separating. Hopefully our grain and our harvest weed seed is all now on our sieves, okay? Sieve loading is critical for both separation capacity and to maintain a mill. The less mog and the less material you end up with on your sieve, the easier the job is. So managing, managing that is absolutely critical, okay? Airflow and the sieve work together. So the theory is that the airflow can keep the material that is lighter than our grain airborne our challenge comes when we have a very, very light seed, okay? So your corn and soybeans, they're good. They're a nice, big, heavy seed. Aerodynamically, all of the material other than grain should be lighter, and so should our harvest weed seed. So that's a good thing. When we're in the smaller materials and the, and the lighter materials, we're trying to harvest something that is less aerodynamic or more aerodynamic and wants to fall through, that's probably a greater challenge for separation wise. Okay. Right -o. Are we okay with all of that? Oh yeah, let's talk about repeats for a second. Okay. Trying to run a very, very low repeat is critical for making this work. This is telling you that I've only dealt with what I need to deal with on my sieve. Our repeats are going to be the test of how effective your airflow and your sieve are working together. And ideally, um, we, don't want, we don't want clean grain in our repeats if we can get away with it. Um, a very small percentage is okay. Just remember that everything that goes through our repeats goes back and ends up getting smashed um, and can then turn into small grain or um, what do we call it over here? Um, minor admixture, okay? So 
Does that that all everyone make sense with that? Yeah. Pete Newman here. Um, can you hey, just buddy. expand? I've heard you say it a lot at our workshops about how um, why putting a mill on the back of a harvester helps you learn more about harvesting than you've ever learned. Can you just expand on that? Why is it? Is it because you find out about which side the grain is going? Or is it more about learning about airflow? Can you just expand on that a little? So, so when you go and put a mill on the back of a, one of these machines, um, you have to divide the two crops streams. Just flick the next slide, Pete, for a sec, please. So what we're going to do, we're just going to add something in here. There's the baffle. So there's the baffle, right? So understanding what the baffle does, we, what we have to do now, we've got to divide, divide our chaff and our straw stream. We have to keep our, all our row to discharge off our sieve. When, when we've got a normal open separator, no divider baffle, no mill on the back of the machine, if straw lands on the sieve and gets spread by the chaff spreader, who cares? It, it doesn't matter. But when you go and put a mill on the back of the harvester, if you land anything additional on the sieve, it's got to be processed, right, by that, by that weed mill. Um, those big stalks are the enemy of a weed mill. Um, we'll see engine loads go up 30% just from straw. Okay, so, and I'm talking about wheat straw. So you go, you go and throw, you know, I don't know, you know, two or three percent of your wheat straw on the sieve. That's two or three percent of that material that the mill has got to turn into dust. And remember, if you get a, you know, get a wheat stalk, you know, two feet long, you got to turn it to dust. And that, that's what you're trying to do. So your engine loading goes through the roof. And as soon as your engine loading goes, your RPM dies, your fan speed slows down, the material on the sieve lands, and you just walk everything out the back. Okay. So that's that's the first bit. Yeah, Pete. No, yeah, I, can I jump bit. in here, please, Brad? Yes. Um, yeah, with all our, our schooling, and, and this goes for machines with our harvest weed set control on the back and the ones without it, um, we've tried... On the thresher side there, so if you have a look at your slide on the left-hand side, we try to keep all the material in there, uh, all the bad material, I should say, so the straw and whatever. So the more open we've got, and I'm talking about the opening of the of the concave, so the more open we've got, the more material will fall through onto our conveyor augers. And as soon as it hits our conveyor augers, it's going to come to our top surf, and that's exactly what you're saying. We don't want to overload the mills with straw. Um, so if we can keep our straw in the in the thresher area, uh, which will go into our separation area and then getting discharged through our beater, um, that's better for the machine, whether you've got a mill on it or not. We want to keep the sieve loading as little as possible, as small as possible from the big stuff. We don't want any big stuff in there. So that separator baffle or divider baffle, whatever we want to call it, what we've learned is that it has to be at a minimum of a 24 degree angle. If that baffle is any flatter than that, the material will not slide. Okay, dry material will, but if it's a little bit tacky or a little bit green, it'll glue itself to it. So that's the critical point. So now if we go, if we were to go and add the bit that's missing off this diagram, which is our chopper at the back, you draw a line from the chopper inlet at the bottom on a straight line up to the back of the beta baffle or the beta extension underneath the beta, the beta pan, it's barely 24 degrees in a straight line. And that's, and that's our challenge. We've gone and put that baffle in there. Um, and, and the other thing, the another thing that we do is when we go and add that weed mill, we actually move the chopper back just a little bit. And that then narrows the entry into the chopper and the distance between the baffle and the chopper entry is reduced. So if you end up with any material balling or any bulk in there, um, you can basically haystack the combine. You just, it turns it into a baler. There's not enough room for the material to go through. So, yeah. Um, Brett, Brett yep. just, 
just where I guess with Brett and Cassie, in terms of going to what you discussed before, which is when and you talked about it, the clinics, that element of what we're trying to do, given material, given whether you've got harvest wheat seed or not, getting an idea, why are we tried to do all that, keep the material close. Brett Cassie said you wanted to keep it in that area. What what are you doing to do that? What what's what are you doing to keep that material in there, in that thrashing space, in those different machines? Go green, Cass. Uh, where possible, um, use the smaller concave that's available for the for the product. Um, so, you know, years ago we would say use a 31, 25, 25 concave for wheat and barley. Um, we've changed our mindset now a little to use three 31 wire concaves. So instead of all the larger material falling through our, our threshing area, uh, we keep it in there and we'll go through the separation area and we'll go through our beta. Um, so we would like to, where our mindset before was, we want to get it as open as possible with our concave wires as wide as possible for material to fall through. We want to keep it in there and get rid of it. We don't want to overload our top surf because, you know, everything that goes over our surfs will go into our mills. So we just want to have the, the chaff, the weed seed and the good material that we, um, or well, now the good material will go through our top surf, but everything that we want to destroy, the light stuff, will go into our mills. So any anything that's large, anything that's a, you know a stalk or a, or a straw, in touch straw, we want to get that out through our beta. So when you're talking about in that uh, where you're putting the thirty ones, you, you, that's that's in the first um, concave setting area. Is that correct? Uh, one, two, and three, mate. So in the old days, we used to put number one, a 31 wire. Um, but now we we recommend to put three 31s. So and in terms of... Yeah, go. I understand with, with corn, we've got the corn concave, which is the round bar concave. Um, we also got to um, see it in our heads that in the threshing area, we've got our rotor element that's actually pushing the material against our concaves. So the larger we've, we've got the gap there, or the larger area between the concave bars, we've got the more material you will push through. Um, so my suggestion there is we need to run those concaves as wide as possible to prevent that material from getting pushed through it. Maybe I can ask a question out to Rodney. Rodney, you're, you're running a John Deere um, and you're running it in sunflowers. What, what concaves did you have? And the sunflowers? Yeah. Uh, I think we were running the corn. We were running the, the same corn, the bars, in other words, instead of wire, we ran bars. I think we made, I believe we put one screen in or wires, concave, and other two were on bars. Do you change your concaves for, between crops much at all? We change them between wheat and corn. They run the wire and wheat, which which is really informative. I'll I'll be more cautious of what we do now, but they run wire and wheat, and then they switch to bars for corn. And then we run a combination of bars and wire on some flowers. My, Anybody I, else? My yes, problem, sorry, my, I guess my problem in our conditions, they change so dramatically is when you're destroying everything and coming out the back of the machine. <clears throat> Those conditions change. You, you just stop once every couple of days and completely disengage all of that to check how much you're running over the separator from an actual visual standpoint, or you just simply go off your, your gauges. How do y'all? decide when to change that spacing. Cassie, do you want to comment? Uh, yeah, how do you decide to, to change that, to change the concaves in, in different crops? Yeah, and in, and in change, yeah, and in changed conditions. It sounds like it sounds, Rodney, if I'm hearing it, you've got changed conditions, not just crop you're talking about. Is that correct? Right, so you're, you start shelling corn, corn is on the green side wet and as yep. you get 
in the harvest, it gets drier. The conditions change throughout the day, even. So when you're when you're completely polarizing those seeds, you can't really go look at the back of the machine to visually see how much corn you're not getting off the cob. That's going that's staying in the, the separator in the cylinder. So do you yep. stop really and just disengage the chopper and seed destructor for visual verification? Yep. So first of all, you can have a look what's coming out the back of your machine. So anything that you're going to see with a with a terminator or a destructor on the back, you're going to know that it's coming out of your beta. Right. So that that's the material that will come through your rotor. Um, and then yeah, you need to open up. Brett will explain of, uh, on the seed terminator how you can determine the seed loss going through the terminator. So you're actually taking screens out of it, go and harvest, and then have a look at two meters behind the or to the right hand side of the back wheel. Uh, you'll actually do a drop tray there, and you will see what's what's coming through your terminator because you're not chopping it up. You've taken the screens out of it. Um, your the, just to Cassie, just to interrupt a second. So Rodney's using an SCU, so he can completely disengage the SCU and pull that back out the way, uh, yeah. which means you're going to be able to see that spread the same way. But obviously, uh, it's just a different way of doing the measure. The measurement still applies, Rodney. You still can. You need to measure what's coming off the back of your beaters and see what's there. Um, I think your question before was as well, like during the day. Whether we need to change anything on our concaves, I I wouldn't say like you're asking whether you need to change the concaves during the day when conditions change. The, yeah, the the the, sep the distance, the spacing of your cylinder, your rotor to your concaves. So as the grain gets drier in the afternoon, typically yep. you can open up the separator a little bit. Yeah, but when it's destroying everything in the back and the seed destructor and the choppers destroying yep. everything, there's not a whole lot to go back and visually see. So I, I've struggled with old school plot combine and you just stopped once or twice a day, got out and looked at the back of the machine. But the seed destructor, everything is pulverized. You're destroying the evidence. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm kind of curious how the most practical way to approach that problem was. Yep, so first of all, that's the grain loss tray on the beta, so you can see what's coming out of there, and then disengaging it and open, open your um, SEU up at the back so everything goes into a windrow. Okay, thank you. But Joe, Cassie, you, I think Rod is also talking about, if I'm not wrong here, is whether it should change concaves or, or change the, the, what the concave gap is to the rotor. Um, is there any anything you've got suggestions on there that um... yep. uh, concave change during the day? No. So whatever concave you've got in there, you can change it between crops. Um, but during the day when you're in corn or beans or whatever, just leave it in. Um, and obviously the hotter it gets during the day, um, the easier things will fall out of the head when you fresh it, like whether it's sunflower or corn, or whatever. So the easier it will, will crash out of, the, out of the head. So we can open up our concave. So open it up more. And then at night time when things are getting a little bit tougher, you can close your concaves up to, to hit it harder. But leave your concaves in. You don't need to, to change that during the day. Just play with your rotor gap. So you know, Brett, is that that's the same what you're talking about with the case? Um, obviously, we're talking single rotor at the moment. That, that same whether it's case or with the New Holland as well. Is that be the same? Do you want to keep that material, you know, breaking it up too small? Would that be right? Yeah. And generally, what I get guys to do. I mean, obviously, we set our case headers up fairly differently. Um, over here because we don't harvest corn. So, um, <clears throat> but what we'll do is say to the guys, test. So they'll end up with settings. So they'll go through and they'll, I mean, two days ago, we set a new machine up, uh, an 8250. Um, we would have done 40 tests in the space of a six hour day. Um, 
through that process. But as the temperature changed during the day, we were able to go, oh, right, okay, here's, here's the point where we need to start making a change. And you remember that. So um, a lot of these guys will go, oh, hang on, you know, when the, when the outside air temp drops below 28 degrees C, I need to pull my concave up a couple of notches. And then when it gets below 20, I need to bring it up a couple more. Um, and once they know that, they've tested it, they've worked out what, what is happening, they then have that benchmark. And then until they change crop variety or change, um, change location, you know, we've got guys that got farms that are 40 kilometres apart and the weather can be vastly different. Um, they've got those numbers. Does, does that sort of make sense? So you've got, an, you've got an ambient reference to what's going on It'll give you an idea when you need to need to make your change, but you need to quantify your your loss. So um, with your SCU, you can bypass it really easily. So what I'd say is do two tests each time you test. So run along, do your do your do your test with the machine as it is working, then bypass your mill and repeat the test. The difference in that number tells you what's coming off your sieve. That's probably the easiest way to explain it. So the other comments you've made before is just because we're also looking at testing briefly. Um, we, are we testing just off the off the back axles there to see what's there, or, or what it, what are you teeing? What would you be recommending to test if you you're running those machines uh, there, Brett? I probably initially I would test in three places. I'd test test. Um, a couple of metres right, a couple of metres left and dead centre and work out where my machine throws more material. So I've got an understanding of what the, what the spread is out the back. Okay, so I'll do that first. And once I know that, it, let's, let's just say, you know, my left side is heavier and my right side is lighter and my middle is probably the average, then that's where I would test, if that makes sense. So, so that you've got a benchmark. And once you know the way that, machine, that your machine actually um, spreads, then you can test in that place all the time. Um, and then do those two tests, test bypassed and test with mill engaged. Those, the difference in that number will give you your sieve loss. So the only, your challenge, the guys that are running IHSD, their challenge is just remember that your sieve is going to be windrowed when you test. Um, so you need, you need to take that into consideration. Okay. What, why, why, what's the implication there, Brad? Uh, Brad? Um, you, well, when you're spreading, remember that you're, you're measuring a spread width of whatever, you, whatever you're spreading. Um, and when you take the door off the back of your IHSD to do your windrowed test, that whole spread is now congregated into the width of the header. So, so your, your loss that you will get in your fan when you're windrowing will be much higher than the loss yeah. when you're spreading. Yeah, just remember that you've got to calculate that out. So you've congregated it. So, so we've done some testing. We try to understand what's coming off through our beaters. Just uh, we, we've we're trying to keep the material, correct me if I'm misunderstanding this guys, and I know you will. So we're keeping it, the material uh, close as we can in the threshing area uh, and not breaking that up too small. And then we're looking at that flow of separation. So we're looking at the orange, orange um, arrows to try and get the grain and material through. Uh, and we don't want that material, uh, when we come to separation, we're looking at then what are we trying to do there? Can you tell us what are your what are your setups you're looking at within your case New Hollands or in your separation area for the sort of crops these guys are facing? So the biggest thing um, in your cereals about trying to manage um, for harvest weed seed control is if you if you're running into rotor loss, um, you're throwing you're throwing your weed seed out the rotor with it. So we have to do everything we possibly can to eliminate rotor losses. So every, every tool in your toolbox. Um, so my, my problem with all of this is that I have never had to harvest corn with a machine that I've modified the rotor on. So we do a whole bunch of 
um, different rotor mods over here to try and get um, out to increase our ability to thrash. And so that means that we can run our concave a lot wider. Um, and then by running our concave a lot wider, our straw stays intact more and we end up with a lower sieve loading. How that's going to affect the machine that we're trying to harvest corn with, I, I honestly don't know. And the only way I'm going to know is um, to, find, to find a guinea pig who wants to put his hand up and have a play um, and then tell me whether it worked or it didn't. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's, that's my dilemma at this point in time. But everything else, I know um, what Cassie and I have been talking about largely with rotor mods um, will, will generally work. It'll work for soybeans and everything else, um, all of your cereals, all of your small grains um, for all of these machines. So um, do we want to talk specifics, Pete? Just nod if you want to. I think I think it probably is. I've got to also acknowledge we've got a sunflower um, crop where we're talking about as well as a soy and um, and the corn. But I think talking some specifics. But I think overall, guys, what what we're what Brett and Cassie are saying is this: is how do we thrash better and softer? How do we then get the separation happening? Um, yeah, let's go through some specifics, and the guys can ask some questions and um, go from there. So what we started doing with red harvesters 30 years ago, and everyone said it didn't work on, on the new machines, on the flagships, um, we've gone back to throwing, pulling out the old book and doing what we used to do with the, um, with the smaller, the mid-range machines. So what we, are, what we are doing here, everyone who runs a red machine will know that you can move the concave quite easily. Um, and for harvesting corn, it's zero point is at six o'clock. We're moving our concaves to the right. Uh, we're moving them eight to 10 mil to the right. Um, often we've got to slot the bracket to get it to move that far. What that does is that moves our pinch point from a single bar pinch point at six o'clock to a multi bar pinch point at around eight o'clock. Okay. So let's say multi-bar. So if we think of our rotor will come through and it will strike the first bar on the left-hand concave, which is right at six o'clock. It's now going to pinch and it's going to go up on the left-hand side and it will be at about eight o'clock and there'll be about four or five bars that that um, concave, that that rotor bar is going to intersect with. So what that's meant is that harvesting cereals um, traditionally, we've run a concave opening from 8 to 15 or 16. That concave opening now is 30, 35. Okay. What that's done is that's freed up a lot of space. Um, the rotor is your biggest consumer of horsepower. So loosening all that material up in that rotor cage gives you back a whole swag of horsepower. So doing that, we've seen guys that have had up to 70% up to jump in their capacity by moving that concave um, and freeing up a whole bunch of engine horsepower. It's given them the ability to poke a lot more material through. Um, and then, then the second thing that we do, when you do these two things together, we have the ability to put 34 spike brass bars on the back of our rotor in the separation area, okay? So anyone's harvested rice, if you have a look at your rice rotor, you've got a full pack of rice of um, spike brass bars to handle that biomass and that extra material. We're applying the same rule to try and harvest for weed seed control where we're taking two feet of straw. It just won't separate. So adding the spike grass bar in the separation area um, increases our separation and it moves the point at which we get rotor losses. So you'll still get them. Hopefully we run out of engine horsepower first, um, but we've got, we've got machines with zero rotor loss up to, in cereals, up to 65 tonnes an hour and running a harvest weed seed mill. So, um, 
and those machines were normally getting rotor losses at around that 37 to 40 ton an hour mark. So we've changed, changed their spectrum um, and changed their capacity and not increase their fuel burn. So by doing those things, righto. Will this work for corn? The question I need to ask um, is concave clearance when harvesting corn. Do we have enough room to be able to poke all that corn through there without that multi-bar rub point becoming too much for the engine to handle engine load wise? Okay, that's the question I can't answer. Right. So, so every other crop that we've ever poked through it, we've seen performance gains in. And soya beans very like a lupin or very like a bean to harvest. And that's no problem. These they uh, we've increased efficiency in those crops as well. So the I've key done a little bit of I've done a little bit of corn bread. Um, and I, I can't see that your modifications will have any negative impacts on the machine. Um, even with the modifications that you told me about the John Deere, where we will put small rotor elements in instead of the corn element, um, I can't see that it will be a negative influence on the machine. I, I, the, the corn kernels comes off the cob easy enough if you if you eat it. Um, our gap doesn't need to be that small, so I, I can't see any negative impacts with your modifications. Maybe that's a good well. point. To, yeah, I think maybe a good point for Cats to talk about that the, we're doing with green headers in that space. Um, and maybe throw back to everybody else to shoot us down with whatever they like yep. when I ask any questions. Cass, do you want to carry on? Yeah, mate. Um, so on, on the green um, rotor, we have got, um, this is something that I've only learned over the last couple of years. Um, it's actually a rotor element that's made for corn. So it's got the rib at the back of the element. Um, so what we want to do in our cereals is we want to take that lip that's on the back of the elements. We want to take that off. So we, we fit a small grain element to it. Um, and on the class eight and nine machines, we can actually put another in the dense back rotor. We can put another nine extra elements in it. Um, and that just, it's the same effect what Brett has got. You know, there's more rotor elements in the machine. So it hits it harder. And it's the same effect that we that we get with moving the, the concave pinch point. Instead of running it at 15, we can open it up to 35. So we get more material into it. Um, and again, less fuel burn. We had a, a report a couple of weeks ago uh, where a customer has made these modifications and it's 2% less fuel burn on the machine. Um, so yeah, putting those extra elements in will start the separation and the threshing earlier in the piece. And we keep on saying that the, the earlier we can do our job in these machines, the better the machine will perform. So if we can start our threshing and separation towards the front of our rotor, the, towards the back of the machine, it will just handle it better. And the, the second point that we've made is in our separation area, um, the spaces that we've got on top of the separator, separator grates definitely put them into um, into the corn position. So we take the separator grate away from the rotor. Um, we've got to remember in the separation area, we don't have that big block that's trying to push the material through our wires. We've only got single fingers that just stirs all the material up to fall through the separator grates. So definitely pull our separator grates away from our rotor. Okay, so if there are any questions for Cassie or any comments, guys, who, or questions for Brett, if you've got a red machine. I'm curious, you, um, you mentioned only threshing as much as you have to, and you can thresh more, I guess, by turning the rotor faster or closing the gap down or Vice versa, I guess. So, how do you how do you know which to do that to thresh only as much as you have to? Like, because you got you could turn the rotor faster and have bigger clearance, right? Or you could turn the rotor slower and have yep. less clearance and kind of get the same result. But which is better? Um, rotor as slow as possible. When we've got a rotor that's running flat out, we will see a lot of grain cracks. So we can pick that up in our in our repeats. 
So the rotor just needs to do the minimum speed that it can. We don't want it to go flat out, especially in corn. Um, it comes off easy enough. Um, so as slow as possible, and we'll see if we open up the repeats door on the machine and go and harvest 100 meters with the door open, we will see the cracked grain coming out of it. So we can, with a concave clearance, if we make that smaller and wider, that you won't see a crack in there. You'll see the crack with the speed of the rotor. So the harder we hit it, the higher the speed, the more cracks we will see. And that is, you know, a few years ago, we've done a lot of beans in our area. And you can start off at 600 RPM on your rotor and you will see in your repeats on the, on the screen, on the camera, how many cracks you've got in there. And then you slow that rotor down, down, down. You leave the concave where it is. And once you hit 350, you will see just like that, all my, all my cracks has disappeared out of my repeats. So rotor speed is for cracks. The higher it is, the more you will crack it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. Um, I guess I'm also thinking about keeping straw in there and not coming down and, and loading the sieves and then ending up in the uh, mill. So there's, I guess it's kind of a delicate balance between doing all that stuff. Brett, do you want to make a comment? Um, I, I will generally try and run my, the same as Cassia said, run my rotor as slow as I can. Well, not so much as slow as I can get away with, but remember the volume of material you're putting through is relevant to rotor RPM. Um, so it, it has to be at a reasonable pace, but Cassie is right. Rotor RPM will crack grain, oh, unless you're running your concave on the zero stop, will crack grain a lot more than um, concave clearance. And I use concave clearance for capacity. And what I'll tell people is this, and look, um, Tuesday, uh, sorry, Wednesday this week, I spent all day running around behind a red header that we were setting up in Canola and what we are looking in the windrow behind the machine or in the material that we were collecting behind the machine, we were looking for pods in that, in our, in our drop tray. And so we literally were looking for unthrashed pods and we were tuning our concave clearance based on unthrashed pods that were in there. Cause it's early, you know, the, it was first day harvest. Okay. Um, and so what we were trying to do is open the concave as wide as we can get it until it stopped thrashing. So looking for those unthrashed bits, those, those still pods. In cereals, you'll find part heads. The object of the exercise in a wheat crop, if you can do it, to have the stalk and the backbone and no grain on it, okay? That's what we're trying to do. The reasoning for this is the more of that stuff stays intact, the lower your sieve loading, because there's less of that material on the on the sieve. Um, the little dense packing thing that Cassie was talking about, I did um, three years ago, I did one machine. Two years ago, I did two more. And last year I did another five or six, six, I think. Two of those machines work side by side. They're both John Deere's. They both run seed terminators. The machine that we modified the rotor on has 30% more capacity. No mill belts for the whole harvest. The standard machine, they put four sets of mill belts underneath it. And that the mill belts tell us that's loading, that's sieve loading that's, that's causing that. So just by spending that, that day, and I know it's not easy to do those thrashing elements on a deer, I've done plenty of them now, uh, but it's worth the effort and it's worth the time spent doing it because um, the sieve loading goes away, if that makes sense. Um, Michael, if I can get back to you where you said it's a delicate um, balance between, you know, where the um, chaff and, and straw goes to, um, if that picture that, that or diagram that Peter had on there before, there's a lot of times that I talk to technicians or customers or operators 
where they look at that machine and they see the threshing area and the separator area as one. And we need to get it into our heads to look at it and definitely treat those two areas as two separate areas. At the front on the threshing area, that's where all the action happens. That's where we need to hit it hard. And then we come back to our separation area and there we need to leave it alone. That's where we need to, the separation to happen. So it, you are correct. It is a delicate balance between the two, but if we can differentiate between the, the areas and treat it that way, it, um, it makes more sense afterwards. We, we have a question, Emily, from Claudia. Claudia, do you want to give us your question verbally? Yeah, I can I can read it or Claudio, did you want to just put it out there? Oh, we can't hear you, Claudio. I don't know why it says you're unmuted. How about you read it out, Emily? Yeah, I'll just read it. Um, so Claudio is asking about um high yielding crops. If you compare like a two ton yield soybean with a four ton, you'll have double the chaff volume. Um, what about the airflow? Is it different? Will the airflow be less in the higher yield, uh, the higher yielding crop? And if so, is that going to affect the the mill's performance? Brad, do you want to give us a comment? It's it's about the volume of material more than anything else for airflow to work. What what your airflow has to do is keep that. Um, chaffy material or the lighter material airborne. So some of it has to do with the volume of material. Um, look, we had we had significant challenges. Pete and I talked last night about this on Wednesday, setting uh, setting that machine up because we had assumed because his paddock averages where we were uh, around that two and a half to three ton a hectare in Canola, and so we went off and you know, punched those numbers into our machine and went, okay, we should be doing, you know, 20 to 22 tonne an hour in these conditions. That's what we should be able to get, you know, happy with that. And we were targeting that. And when we actually did a hectolitre weight on the material and started starting to set the new machine up, we realised we were trying to harvest the five tonne crop. No wonder we were getting 4% losses um, because the machine is, just isn't going to handle 40 tonnes an hour on the sieve. It's not going to do it. So does, does that make sense? The, th the throughput and the material that you can handle <coughs> is dependent upon how much grain you can get through the sieve and then how much material trash loading it is. So a two, two to four tonne crop is dependent on how you're trying to get that flow through the machine. If you're trying to, if, if, you, if you can do, you know, 35 tonnes an hour in a two tonne crop and you go the same speed in a four tonne crop, you can't do you can't do 70 tonne an hour, it's not gonna do it. But <clears throat> you, theoretically, if you say, oh, I might be a, my machine is capable of doing 45, yes, you're going to need a little bit more fan speed and yes, you're gonna need a little bit more sieve opening to handle the extra or additional material. Did that answer that? Claudio, the key from what Cassie and Brett will tell you is you're gonna to have to measure. No matter what happens, you're going to have to measure because um, Cassie, I, I, um, if there's moisture in there as well, will that affect uh, what you're going to be doing? Uh, yeah, it will affect it, um, but you're not going to you're not going to adjust your fan accordingly. Once you've set up and you're happy with your losses, you can leave it as that. Um, if you want to adjust your fan every time you're going to hit a two or two point two ton a hectare, and then you go up to four ton a hectare you will be on that fan button all day. So if you are happy with setting it up in the majority of the paddock, um, you, you'll soon see if your yields will fall down to, you know, half a ton a hectare, um, then yes, definitely drop your fan speed down. Um, the moisture will have the same effect as the yield because the more moisture, the heavier it will be. Um, but yeah, I would say just set it up, leave it as it is and, and off you go. If you have a look at the um, the machines for the automation, where you can adjust the fan speed up and down by itself, if you look at that fan RPM, you will see that fan will go up and down all day. It will keep on adjusting it. Um, so you just operating the fan 
yourself, if you need to make adjustments on that yourself, you'll be on that fan button all day. So just set it up and leave it. There will be a difference, but you're not going to see it. What, what about if they see you know, they've got a blowout of green material, the weed? We've obviously seen some pretty ugly looking photos there with some paddocks, uh, fields that have all sorts of crop in. So if they've got more green material, is there anything they therefore need to do then, Cassie? Um, probably a top sieve a little bit more closed. Um, try to get rid of that green material over the sieves. Um, but again, like we've said in our classes, you know, when a, when there's an ideal crop with no, well, that's upstanding with no weeds, no nothing, that's great to harvest. But as soon as it's starting to get a bit testy and green material is really bad for the machines, like it's, that's a really test that you put the machines through. Um, yeah, you're just gonna take it from from paddock to paddock. It it changes all the time, so um, yeah, you just need to deal with that. So the the other comment which was raised earlier, which is uh, pretty apparent, in some of those photos was we're getting a lot of um, blockage happening around that uh, baffle um, or diverter. Um, is and we're seeing that in sunflowers, and we're obviously seeing it in corn. Um, uh, Brett, is there any comment related to that? Any thinking on what we could do? Both the both the John Deere and the case aren't nearly as bad as trying to do this with the New Holland um, because of the distance. So the New Holland, the the beaters will all throw this material about the same distance, but the but the um, actual back end of the New Holland is way longer. Um, so we have to put a draper belt inside there to cart that material back. Um, the, the John Deere and the case, uh, case with the internal chopper is not so bad. It's pretty good when they're running in chop mode. Um, if they're just in beat mode, you can end up with, uh, with straw on the sieve. That becomes a challenge and green material ends up down there. Um, any of the mills aren't going to like green material. Um, so the ones you're dealing with, you don't have choices, um, unfortunately. Um, so I'm not going to talk terminators because you don't have them. But um, uh, <clears throat> if your mill will not handle the volume of green material that you are ending up on your sieve, you have no choice but to bypass it or remove it to harvest it, that's that's all you can do. Do everything you can to keep it off the sieve, but if it if it ends up there, you you can't process it. It's just not going to happen. You, you've all seen what blocks and what causes it. We have the same issue here, so don't worry. Um, that it's it's not it's not common only to you guys. We've got that problem. So that, yeah. that was some Are of we... the biggest challenges that I've seen on on uh, terminators is green stuff. It's yeah, don't like it. So there's yeah, a just been remember a, a terminator questions. is different. With a terminator though, Cass, we can actually change the screens and so on, whereas with the other machines you can't. So um and they don't have terminators. They've only got uh IHSDs and ready tops. So yeah. Michael, you got a question? Yeah, so we've had a and and Kenton, you mentioned green stem and soybean. And I know one of the units in North Carolina had the same struggle where the soybeans and the pods are dry, but the stem is staying green. And it sounds to me like if we could keep that green stem in the straw and going off the beater and not down onto the sieves, we could we could really save ourselves some some heartache there. Is that I, I don't know, Kitten, you you've been the one making the settings and, and changing. Do you I mean do you think there's hope there for that? Uh based on what you've seen? Well, <laughs> The short answer is no. Uh, I tried. So I, if the unit was running, it would clog up so quick that I, I, it was just hard to even do a test. But when I had it, the belt off on the IHSD and I just had the panels open, I went through various from various settings. I opened my uh, uh, concaves up, closed them down, uh, fan wide open, fan slowed down adjusting sieves and I no matter what for me 
I would get so much material in that green stem, uh, long strings of uh, soybean stalks, that it just couldn't even flow out of the the panel on the back of the machine, not not run. Uh, it just they're 80, 90 bushel beans and the 35 foot head, which isn't even that big. I mean, it, and it just clogged up. I mean, when I say clogged up, I mean clog up quick. I could I could not find a setting uh, over a couple hundred acres that made any difference. Uh, your That's machine on concaves, Mike? That's the large bar, I guess you'd call it, not the small. Yep. And yep, screen. I wonder, I wonder whether you would have seen a, a difference if you had a change in a concave. What would you recommend? Uh, soybeans. I guess I'm using the one that I would call soybean. Maybe I described it wrong, but uh, it's set up for soybeans. Yep. Yep. I'll probably, what I've said before, we, we probably try to keep that material into our concave that longer. So it will go through our rotor instead of falling through our concaves onto our conveyor orders. Me open magic. the concave up. Is that what you're implying? No, 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 no. Make our fingers smaller. Get the gap between our fingers smaller. So we keep those stalks in there. So you're saying add uh, additional fingers if, to if, the rotor. If you've got a if you've got a round bar concave that you've used, uh, maybe use the 15 wire concave. Um, so we can see whether we can keep that material in that threshing area for longer, so it can, you know, shoot off through our discharge feeder. That's the only challenge. only thing that I can think about. Yeah, mate. Yeah, the challenge is the round bar. So you think I've got a piece of stalk that's been ground up; it will fall straight through the round bar. So we use we use round bars for various different things, but. And, and I love them, I think they're a fabulous type of concave. But when you've got that green piece of stalk that can fall through the round bar, then maybe a conventional concave run a bit wider and left a bit more open will resolve that because it'll stop that piece landing on the sieve. So, but that's if it's blocking that. Typically what we find, so where Pete and I are going later on today, last year in their green canola, or in their canola, they had a storm go through and it re-germinated. And by the time they finished their canola program, we had standing green flowering canola in a dry canola crop in about a two ton crop. And we had about, you know, I mean, the flower heads were above the, the ripe crop. And we processed that. We couldn't run it through a mill, but we had the bypass doors down and we, we ran that through those three John Deere headers and they, yeah, they had challenges originally because the dealer didn't put the baffle in the right place. I went and moved the baffles and reset their bypass doors. And we were able to process that with those baffles and bypass doors in place. So, um, yeah. Baffle Kenton, positioning that, is everything. So Kenton, this is what Cassie's saying. I, I was just gonna say one of the challenges of the IHSD is you talked about the baffles. When the unit's installed, there's no way to get in there and work on it. Uh, I have one employee that's skinny enough that he can actually fit in. I'm not that big of a guy. I cannot fit. You can't access the machine, so you literally have to pull the whole YHSD off to move a baffle and then put it back on. And that's a huge under. It's a half. Of, you know, it takes another piece of equipment, a forklift, to get it on there, and it's it's not very practical. Uh, I think, don't think we're saying it's easy. That's for sure. I, yeah, I guess the I, first, I'm with you there. <laughs> yeah, so the, I guess the first question is more around what what are your thoughts on maybe trying changing your concaves to what Cassie said, and I guess it's, the next thing is uh, find a skinny employee who can put a, a PTO or a, a, a baffle <laughs> in there. But that's a separate issue. What's your thoughts on the concave idea? Well, I'd be open to the the idea. I th I think some of my challenges is, you know, as a farmer, we're raising, I'm raising soybeans and corn to, and that's what I want to set my, 
my combine I should be set up to harvest the crop, not maximize how many weeds I kill and then throw all my soybeans out the back too. So I feel like I'm, you need to set your combine up for your crop, not the weed is my challenge. What? Cassie, do you want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, again, to what I said before, between threshing and separation. Um, so concentrate on our separation. You're not going to throw anything out if you look after your separation area. So um, I understand what you're saying. Um, but yeah, concentrate on your threshing area. Make sure that you get all your grain out of your pods um, and then separate it in the separation area. So in terms well, yeah, I guess what you're saying is try some some small bars up front and uh, just to push it to the back. That's correct, mate. Yep. And measure it. Because if you measure it, you'll know whether your grain, that soy, soybeans actually not getting lost and the second will be your weed seed. So uh, what Brett said earlier is, Kenton, is uh, we need guinea pigs. If you can put your hand up to be a guinea pig and come back to us with a bit of uh, how that went, that's why we'll all learn. If you come back and go, I tried this, uh, didn't work for these reasons, and I tried this, then great, we've learned. But if no one tries it. And just remember, these rotary combines have been around since 1977, and we're still learning, and we haven't finished. And harvest weed seed mills have been commercially available for five years. Mate, we got a long way to go yet. <laughs> but, the, but the principle is still the same. Firstly, around we need to understand with that rotary machine, um, and you guys are using green and red, um, we need to understand what we're trying to do as Cassie and Brett have been through as it goes through the machine itself and that we're going with trying to thrash early and keep the material in. We're thrashing the material early and keeping it and protecting it. So we keep it open. Uh, uh, what's, your, what's your phrase there, Brett? Anyone ever drive a dirt track speedway car? What's the old saying? Run the ragged edge, loose is fast. The looser you can run it, the faster you're going to go. Right? And you're often you're right on the edge because you know what happens when you go that little bit too far. Yeah. So the aim being there is about your productivity. So you're right, Kenton. This is about you're farming not for weeds, you're farming to get the crop in, but we know we're trying to get rid of our weeds. So we, we, we've got to deal with that issue. So loose is fast, thrash early keep the material in and then focus on your separation. And then when you're coming to the separation, because you've got a harvest weed seed control system in there, we're now thinking about what that means. How do we actually get that material out? One of the things we just talked about was the baffle or, or a belt or a PTO that goes through into there. If you want to know more about that, please talk to Brett um, and find someone super skinny. The, the next part then will be you've got that separation. We try to get where that wheat seed goes. You've, you've started to do that. When you've got green material, you're going to have to try other things and or di you know, divert the material. But the whole intent is to come back to, I've got to measure, set what I'm going to be doing for most of the time. As Cassie just said, I'm going to set this up for how I'm going to be harvesting most of the time and not be on the buttons trying to change stuff because I've got to try and get this to work. But the principle's got to be going from left to right. If I get my hands in the right spot, I've got to thrash early, get material separated as I want it to, and then make make calls. So if you can find a way, would Brett, would would a PTO or, or a belt work with this IHSD? Yeah because you can actually reduce the clearance between your beta and where the baffle is. So normally we wouldn't, we wouldn't do that. We would leave, we'd put the baffle as far back as we can get away with. So we don't interrupt that flow. Whereas when we go and put a draper inside, we, um, 
we can actually bring it right up. So the ones, the ones that, um, the one I designed originally, which is what Seed Terminator use in their New Hollands, um, that is literally a hundred mil from the beta, from the end of the beta pan. That's where that belt starts and it carries the material all the way back and drops it straight into the chopper. Um, so that works well. So, so is that something that the guys could get access to in terms of it to look at if they, they'd need to talk to Eric from Ready Cop and obviously to Judd from IHSD? Is that something they're that's is that seat terminator property or is that able to be sought property? I made I made several prototypes and gave them to them. So um don't don't really know who owns it. Yeah. Come out okay. of come out of my head. I don't I don't believe. And I don't believe anyone can patent it because New Holland have a PSD, which is theirs, which is an internal draper, but it's only the length of the straw hood, not the actual separator. So, you know. No worries. Um, no worries. Let's um so Michael, that's probably a question you need to put to Eric and um, across to Jad, and if you could CC us in that, but if you can, then um, you can access the design from from Brett, and then we just need another guinea pig. I'm putting one in a K7120 this harvest, so yeah. um, I've got that in my head. Okay, I, I, I know we've hit the time limit, Emily, and I know that uh, Cassie's got to go, and I know that we're pretty tight to time. Is there anything else you want to cover, Emily? Um, Just could you give everybody a heads up what the next forum you're hoping to cover? Sure. Yeah. I, I think we're going to, we may have to review what we're going to do because we were talking about going through the separation and, and areas. That was what we we're going to cover next. So okay. we're looking at the sieves. Um, but there are other topics we do want to cover. So we'll come back to you what we want to do next. But okay. probably what would be useful is to get some feedback from everyone, including those who then watch the video. So anybody who's going to come back and watch this video, you need to now come back on WhatsApp and say, this is what I want to know next. Mm -hmm. uh, and that might be that might be the, the next phrase. We kind of do some more responding to that because the, the flow we've been through is the critical element. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yeah, let's let's use the WhatsApp. In fact, um, Kenton, I would ask Brian on the WhatsApp how he cleaned out <laughs> his combine. <laughs> yeah. He yeah. he may he maybe his isn't just sitting there in the shop. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd, I'd love to see more pictures and and questions about modifying and what mm -hmm. types of concaves and stuff on the WhatsApp group would be great. Uh, I'll try to put some on there. Yeah. Let's try and do that. Okay, guys, we're, we're going to have yep. to disappear. The, um, we'll catch you guys soon. Please share your ideas and uh, whether they're great ones that have worked or great ones that haven't. Let's know. Thank you.